Over a year now since the Russia-Ukraine war began, no one expected the war to last this long. But now that it has, and now there are emerging shifting sands, if you will, of geopolitics. We've seen the recent visit of Chinese President Xi Jinping to Moscow. So is there a U.S. and its allies on the one side and China and Russia on the other side? A sort of block emerging, if you will, much like what we saw during the Cold War. And if it indeed is, then what do neutral countries like India do? And the most important question, the million-dollar question, how does this war likely end? Joining me now is the man who predicted that this war would begin in the first place, that uh, NATO was giving Putin no choice but to launch this attack in the first place, is Professor John Mearsheimer. He's the head of Department of Politics at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for speaking with us here on the News 18 Network. My pleasure to be here. All right, let me start uh, off with this question. Uh, it's been over a year now since this war began. There doesn't seem to be an end in sight. And what's worse is that neither side, neither Ukraine nor Russia, uh, seems to want to move towards any kind of engagement or dialogue or eventually move to a ceasefire and a negotiated settlement. In your view, Professor Mearsheimer, how do you see this war likely ending? Because that's the million-dollar question that's top of everyone's mind. Well, I think when people talk about the war ending, they think about some sort of final settlement, some peace agreement that both sides agree to. Uh, I think that's impossible in this case. I think that the best that we can hope for is a frozen conflict. Uh, it seems to me quite clear at this point in time that the Russians will win in the sense that they will end up conquering uh, a large chunk of Ukrainian territory. The Ukrainians are not going to take all the territory back. The Russians are going to end up with a large chunk of territory. And Ukraine is going to end up as a dysfunctional rump state. Uh, and the fact is that the West won't accept that, and the Ukrainians won't accept that. Mm -hmm. And the Russians won't accept a retreat where you go back to the status quo ante. So nobody is going to be content with any meaningful peace agreement that one might think up. And both sides are going to be interested in altering the status quo even more in their favor. But at some point, they'll just tire of all this fighting. And the end result is you'll get a frozen conflict, not unlike the one that you have along the 38th parallel in Korea. So tell me, if this conflict were to freeze right now, as you said, Russia right now controls anywhere between 15 to 20, 25 percent of Ukrainian territory, territory it did not have before this war began last year. Uh, that, of course, is unacceptable either to Ukraine or to the United States and its uh, uh, allies. So the question then being asked is, if Zelensky and team have to accept any kind of settlement, their only settlement is if Putin and his troops withdraw back to a pre-24 February 2022 position, uh, as it existed, which means none of the Ukrainian territory that they currently control is under Russian control. And that, of course, uh, is unacceptable to Putin. Again, I uh, come back to the question, what gives then? Well, there is no solution to this problem. That, uh, that, that's the territorial problem that you're describing, which is only one of the two big problems here. The other question is, what about Ukrainian neutrality? The Russians went to war to begin with because they did not want Ukraine in NATO. They did not want Ukraine as a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. Well, the fact is that the Ukrainians want to be part of the West. And at this point in time, they're a de facto member of NATO. And in any future agreement, they're going to want some sort of security guarantee from the West. And this is unacceptable to the Russians. So the point here is not only do you have a fundamental disagreement that you can't solve over territory, which is what you described, mm -hmm. but you also have a fundamental disagreement over the status of Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis the West, which can't be resolved either. Do you believe that the most likely or most plausible sort of solution to this conflict is Russia keeps what it has, or more or less of what it has right now, which is Donbass, a straight line uh, through the Sea of Azov into Crimea and then access to the Black Sea. Uh, and that acts as some kind of a buffer state, if you will, between Ukraine, which, like you said, is de facto a NATO member right now, and Russia. 
Do you think that's the likeliest or most plausible uh, scenario in a path to peace? Well, I think the key here is that this territory that the Russians have conquered uh, is not going to be a buffer state. It's being incorporated into Russia. It's going to be part of Russia. So you're still going to have a situation where Russia and Ukraine are opposite each other. They share a border that they're fighting across. And there's nothing I see that's going to change that. There's not going to be any buffer state here. Mm -hmm. And given that there's no territorial settlement, you're not going to get a peace agreement. So as I said before, I think the best you could hope for is a frozen conflict. And that frozen conflict, by the way, is likely to turn into a hot conflict uh, at points down the road. Uh, okay. You do not want to underestimate what a disastrous situation uh, we are now facing uh, in Ukraine. This is a major conflict that has no solution what, and has ripple effects all over the world. What, what do you may, what, do, what, what is your take on Vladimir Putin announcing that he intends to place uh, tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus? Uh, do you think that this is a threat or is it more than that? Should the West take him seriously? Do you believe that he's trying to use Belarus as some kind of a launching pad, if you will, for a potential nuclear attack if things were to go south on the battlefield for him? No, I think that he's doing two things here. One is I think that the Russians are worried about Belarus and they're worried about a, a possible war between Poland and Belarus. Uh, and they're putting nuclear weapons in there into Belarus to make it clear uh, that they believe that uh, a deterrent strategy is absolutely essential from Russia's point of view. And then the second thing I believe they're doing is they're just sending a very subtle message to the West that nuclear weapons remain on the table. Uh, and if the West pushes too hard, the Russians uh, might very well use nuclear weapons. The Russians have a deep-seated interest in using the threat of nuclear war as a way of limiting what the West can do. It's very clear that the Biden administration and European leaders understand they can only push the Russians so far because the Russians have nuclear weapons. And this move just reminds Western leaders once again that Russia has nuclear mm -hmm. weapons and it might seriously contemplate using them if necessary. All right. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what Prime Minister Modi said at the SEO summit to Mr. Putin, uh, saying that this is not the era of war, it's an era of, uh, of peace. Uh, the Indian economy has turned out to be a bright spot amidst all the global uncertainties that we're seeing. Uh, considering the fact that India shares a decades-old relationship with Russia and has continued to buy oil, uh, in fact, substantially much more oil today than before when the war began, uh, do you see India uniquely placed with its sort of relationships enmeshed with the United States and its partners and Russia, on the other hand, to try and see if it can play the role of a peacemaker? Or has this conflict gone too far beyond anyone's reach or control or even potential mediation? Well, there's no way India can play any meaningful role as a peacemaker because there's no deal that the Indians could negotiate between the two sides it has nothing to do with India. The question is whether there's a diplomatic solution to this war. And there's, as I said before, no diplomatic solution. So it doesn't matter whether India or any other country tries to broker a deal. There's no deal to be had. I think that your point that India uh, sort of... Uh, operates in a very unusual space is correct. Uh, the Indians, of course, have very good relations with the United States, in large part because of the China threat. And at the same time, the Indians have very good relations with the Russians. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change. I, I think from India's point of view, this war has not been a disaster. And in certain ways, the Indians have benefited. I think the two winners, one could argue, in this war are India and China. Mm -hmm. Let me talk a little bit about uh, India and China. We have our own differences. There was, an, uh, there was an, a violent conflict that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, there are still parts of that northern border which are unresolved. Uh, how do you see this sort of playing itself out, particularly in the aftermath of what we've seen in the last few days and weeks, there is now a very firm Beijing-Moscow axis uh, 
And then you have India, which so far is a neutral country, but is increasingly moving towards the US-led sort of alliance of countries, if you will. Well, I think that there's no question that over time, the Indians will move closer to the United States simply because of the China threat. Uh, the China threat's only going to grow with time, and this is going to cause significant problems for the Indians, not only uh, in the Himalayas, but also in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and the Indians will be pushed closer to the United States. But I don't think this is going to hinder India's relations with Russia. Uh, India is in a very interesting situation uh, where it can have good relations with the Russians, and it won't poison uh, U.S relations with India in large part because the Indians and the United States need each other to mm -hmm. deal with China. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what your assessment is of Xi Jinping's recent visit uh, to Moscow. We saw, you know, the Bonhomie there clearly, and, and particularly what he said as he was parting from Moscow, where he said uh, to Putin, and I quote my friend, we're seeing changes like the kind we haven't seen in a hundred years, and you and I are driving those changes. Do you believe this war between Russia and Ukraine has accentuated these camps? You have Russia and, Ukraine, uh, Russia and China firmly in one camp. You have the U.S. and its NATO allies in another camp, almost reminiscent of, uh, of what used to be the case during the Cold War. Yeah, I think there's no question what this war has done is to drive the Chinese and the Russians closer together. Uh, and it's also bogged the United States down in a war in Eastern Europe. What the United States should be doing now is pivoting full force to East Asia to deal with the China threat, number one. And number two, it should have good relations with the Russians. And the United States and the Russians should, if anything, be allied against the Chinese. If you have three great powers in the system, the United States, China, and Russia, and the United States is one of those great powers, and its most dangerous competitor is China, it makes eminently good sense for the United States to be allied with Russia and not to push the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. But mm -hmm. what the Americans have foolishly done is they've not only driven the Russians and the Chinese closer together, but furthermore, the Americans are now bogged down in this war, so they can't pivot to Asia. So I think China, as I said before, is a big winner as a result of the Ukraine war. And the longer the war goes on, from China's point of view, the better it is for China. Do you believe that's why it's manifesting itself in the way we see what's happening between Saudi Arabia and Iran in the Middle East? We're also hearing reports about normalization of ties between Syria and the UAE and Syria and Saudi Arabia. Do you believe China is stepping into a void left behind by the United States? As you said, it's bogged down by what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, perhaps even bogged down by what's happening in Taiwan, that it's taking the foot off the pedal, if you will, uh, in the Middle East. I put it in slightly different terms. I agree with the thrust of what you say. But I think from an American point of view, it's worse than that. And that is, I think that people around the world, people in other countries, tend to think these days that the United States is not a reliable partner. It's not just that the United States is bogged down uh, in this war uh, in Ukraine. It, it's also the fact that you have a sense that the United States doesn't know what it's doing, that the United States makes a mess of everything it tries to deal with. Uh, so I think uh, countries like Saudi Arabia just don't trust the judgment of the United States, in addition to the fact that they think the United States is bogged down yeah, not only in Europe, but uh, in East Asia as well, and therefore doesn't care that much uh, about the Middle East. You, so you see, when you look around the world, that the United States is in trouble in all sorts of places. Do, do you believe also what's happening internally in the U.S. is giving sort of fodder, if you will, to countries like China or Russia, whether it's a banking crisis, whether it's Donald Trump and his almost you know, every, uh, controversial statements almost every day that he's making, We've also seen, uh, you know, all the, all, all the gun violence, even, even what we saw in Nashville just uh, a few hours ago. Uh, all of this is making countries like China and Russia uh, turn around and point a finger at the U.S. saying that you have no right to comment on our affairs because look, look at what's going on uh, within the U.S. 
I think all of what you describe contributes to the impression that many people around the world have that the United States has lost its bearings, that something is wrong in the United States. Uh, it's not just the conduct of foreign policy, it's the conduct of domestic policy, and these two things go together. Uh, and it seems to me that if the United States is going to deal with the China threat and continue to try to manage the world the way it has done in the past, it's going to have to shift the way it's doing business, both internally and externally, because, again, there's something wrong here. Okay. One final word, and, and you had developed this theory of offensive realism in the context of great powers wanting to ensure that their neighborhood is safe of any kind of external threat. Uh, the Chinese have often cited that the reason the U.S. grew almost in an unprecedented way after the Second World War was because there was no power willing to challenge the U.S. either on the Atlantic side or on the Pacific side. So the Chinese are seeking to do the same thing in the East and South China Seas, and Russia is seeking to do the same thing in its near neighborhood. But then you've faced a lot of flack for that. How do you defend that theory? Well, I think that there's no question that that's what the Chinese are doing, not the Russians. The Russians are not powerful enough to dominate Europe. They're not even powerful enough to conquer Ukraine, all of Ukraine. Russia is a weak, great power. China is a different matter. And what China is trying to do is it's trying to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. And I don't blame the Chinese one bit. If I was the national security advisor in China, I would be telling the Chinese leaders that what they should do is try to dominate Asia. They should try to make sure that China is by far the most powerful country in Asia and that China should go to great lengths to push the Americans out of East Asia. China should have its own Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this makes eminently good sense from China's point of view. From India's point of view and from America's point of view, this is not good news. You don't want to see, you meaning India, don't want to see China become a regional hegemon any more than the Americans do. All but right. again, China has a different set of incentives. All right, Professor John Mearsheimer, as always, a pleasure speaking with you, sir. Thank you very much for your time and your insights. You're welcome. All right, so the entire conversation with Professor John Mearsheimer going up uh, on News18.com, our website, as well as on the YouTube and Facebook pages of CNN News18. Thanks for your time.